we're going to be discussing today uh, on violence, part one. Uh, you were all sent, uh, I believe, um, uh, a video uh, in which I uh, get discussed five quotes from it to give you a, a way through it. That way I will have to do less of an introduction. Uh, I hope. Um, uh, I'm not sure how many of you had a chance to read it, to watch it, uh, or how much sense it made. So we're going to try and uh, do this in a new way, which is to sort of maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give one a one minute or so introduction and then open it up for questions and we'll see where we go. Um, the essay on violence uh, is written um, in response to uh, a number of factors. One is the student movements, but also um, the increased glorification of violence that RN uh, sees and notes uh, throughout the intellectual uh, sphere. This is one of a series of articles that um, uh, really deals with intellectuals and her worry uh, about the role of intellectuals um, in modern government and modern politics. Uh, and so uh, she tries to ask the question on violence, what is the significance of this interest in violence today? And um, in the briefest uh, response that I can offer is that we are increasingly living in a world um, of what she would call praxis ent zug, um, the withdrawal of action. Um, we are living in a world of bureaucracy, of scientific processes, of disempowerment and disenfranchisement. We're living at a time in which most common people, most not only common people, but many people simply feel like the world has pass them by in a way they've lost control and that we can't control uh, or influence um, the world. And this is a loss of freedom, it's a loss of action, and it's a sense of helplessness. And um, the interest in violence from RN's point of view is uh, one uh, way to um, feel empowered to feel like we can interrupt these impersonal, bureaucratic, seemingly historical and unstoppable processes through a kind of spasm of violence. Um, and she says, sometimes it works, uh, but not always. And the danger is that uh, violence as a means has unpredictable consequences and will often lead not to the end that we wanted to achieve, but to more violence. Um, and the fundamental, I think, so if that's the fundamental background of the essay, the insight of the essay is that we confuse violence and power uh, because it is not only violence that can interrupt these seemingly uh, unstoppable scientific bureaucratic processes. But there's also another way to stop them, which is through action. Action, which for Arendt means uh, to act together with others in a way, uh, in the public sphere, in a way that's meaningful, so that others will see and experience your action, react to it, talk about it, create new stories, and thus change the direction of the world. That's what action is. And so because we can change the direction of the world through action, violence is not the only way to interrupt these processes. Um, so that's, I think, the, the intellectual background of, of the essay. Uh, I, as, as I said, I've, you've all been sent um, about a 15 to 16 minute um, uh, uh, um, video in which I, I try to explore some of these questions. I'm happy to elaborate on those if you have questions or uh, on other answers. I know also some of you have sent in some comments and questions on the Google chat that we have. Um, and I'm happy to, I'm, I've responded to some of those in print, but I'm happy to respond uh, verbally if you'd like. So I'm gonna throw it open to question and discussion and uh, ask you uh, to, to try and lead the discussion. We're gonna try it this way and we'll see how it works. So if you need to talk, uh, unmute your mics and uh, let's start. 
Uh, this is Gary Patton. Uh, I uh, am struck by perhaps the truth that this sort of flow of uh, history progressing uh, essentially almost autonomously, which some hope that violence might interrupt to achieve something better, uh, which Aaron is really disagreeing with as a technique of, in a sense, changing history in a positive direction, uh, that the flow of history that we're really talking about is in fact, nowadays at least, and there is an allusion to this uh, in uh, the essay, it seems to me, as she talks about what happened economically uh, to get out of the Great Depression through World War II, that essentially our economic, political, and social history now is essentially the history of violence. So it is particularly clear that you cannot achieve some new direction, some new thing in the world through violence, because that is pre precisely the old thing in the world. That is exactly what history is today, the escalation and continuation of violence. And now violence has become universal. We no longer have war of countries against countries in which we pick battlefields and send out designated soldiers to fight among themselves uh, to achieve victory or not. Everybody in the world at all times everywhere is subject to the violence which is pandemic in our society and that therefore it is impossible to use violence to make the changes we need. We, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. I apologize. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Um, I, I, the, the pith of what Gary said, I, I think, is, is that the world is awash in violence. And uh, because violence is now the, in a sense, condition of the world we live in, um, violence has even maybe further uh, lost its ability to interrupt uh, the, uh, the, pro the the processes the uh, of of the world, um, I, you know I I don't know if that's fully true. I mean I think there are um, there are different kinds of violence, um, and there are particular acts of violence that um, that I don't think uh, are completely ineffective. So. Uh, um, it's 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 a good point. I mean, I think there's a difference between let's just say uh, sending hundreds of thousands of soldiers uh, to Afghanistan and Iraq to fight terrorism, than um, assassinating Osama bin Laden. Um, uh, I think certain kinds of one-off uh, uh, attacks um, certainly can uh, be effective. Uh, at times, I mean, Arendt uh, talks about the fact that if violence is going to be effective, it's generally going to be effective on the short term. Why on the short term? Uh, because um, long term violence is unpredictable and uh, will generally, as I think Gary is rightly saying, you know, sort of feed into uh, a, a culture of violence uh, that. Um, you know, in a sense, perpetuates itself. And, uh, and, but I don't think um, single acts of well timed, uh, justified violence um, are always ineffective. Um, I mean, I just gave one example of it. Um, but uh, I, I, I do think it, it's possible. I'm happy to hear uh, people respond to that. This is Bob Meyerson. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I don't quite get the distinction between uh, the unpredict unpredictable consequences of violence 
and the unpredictable consequences of any action. Isn't violence just another kind of action? Very much so, Bob. Uh, they're all unpredictable. The difference um, from our end's point of view is that um, the means of violence um, um, are often what she calls overwhelm the ends. Um, so that when you act violently, yes, it's unpredictable, but um, the means can be so destructive that uh, they become more important than the ends. Whereas um, acting, and there's different ways to act, but speaking in public, um, uh, you know, I mean, we'll use a, you know, a figure, a, a, an example that I think everyone knows, the, the Martin Luther King, I have a dream speech or the civil rights movement um, was clearly an example of action that Arendt found um, deeply impactful and, and, and beneficial. Uh, and uh, for her, um, you know, this is a different means of action than violence. Um, yes, it has unpredictable consequences. We don't know, and it's had good consequences, and let's be honest, also some bad consequences. Um, but the means um, have not been uh, have not overwhelmed the ends. If that, if that, if that, if I can make that distinction, and that's what I think she thinks is the difference. Does that make sense, Bob, or not? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Um, Gary, I don't know if I've asked, answered your question in the way you want. Um, you're, I'm happy to have you follow up on it. Well, <clears throat> uh, you answered the question, but not in the way I want. But uh, uh, I don't agree with you uh, that there is this fundamental kind of distinction that can be made between what you were calling the one-off uh, sort of very precise of violent uh, interventions and a sort of the generality of what violence is. And I think it is true that this generalized uh, use of violence as really what politics and government has become all about uh, is the big problem and the one-off uh, violence, uh, at least on the short term, which you did make that distinction, that's true. You can achieve some short-term gains. But if you look at the uh, assassination or the killing of bin Laden, which you you advanced as an example of perhaps where there's a one-off intervention, a violent intervention that has a positive effect, uh, I think it's quite unclear that the effects are positive. It was clear to me that that was largely revenge as opposed to intervening to stop future movement. And, uh, you know, what has happened, it seems to me, is the disease has metastasized and diffused uh, after uh, bin Laden's uh, assassination or death, uh, because in fact, the impetus of violence is prevail prevailing out there among Al Qaeda uh, and the organization that he was the head of. Now there's no clear head that you can say, we could stop that, we could stop the uh, violence. And if you look at what we just did with Iran uh, in terms of nation relationships, there was one where our president said, and I think correctly, hey, we should go to the head of possible violence and make a deal for peace as opposed to trying to kill him. So I think I do disagree with you, uh, although I understand your point, which I is, you know, it's a true point. But I, I really do think in, in our, you know, what is going to be the action today that might change the course of history in the positive direction is going to be some radical re-understanding by people in the world that violence is not the way we solve our problems. And maybe the global warming, the response to global warming will get us there. I'm hoping so. There's obvious positive things we could all be spending our time and money doing, uh, but uh, violence is not gonna do it. Yeah, I'm, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. Um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to respond to it and briefly and we'll see how much we want to go further. So later in, in the essay, and I don't know how much of it you've read um, in part three uh, in in the Crisis of the Republic edition on page 176 to 177, 
if you don't have that edition, it's footnote. It's around footnote 167 to 168 uh, in part three. Um, uh, she's she 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 comes back to this very issue, right? And she says that um, uh, violence does not promote causes, um, but it can serve to dramatize grievances and bring them to public attention. And as a result, uh, she says that violence can, uh, at times, ensure a hearing for moderation. I think that's an exceptionally interesting line. She also says violence can be in the service of reform. Um, and she has one, she gives an example then, which is that um, the riots at Columbia University in 1967, she says, um, brought the university to address uh, uh, inequalities in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the educational system at Columbia that simply would not have been addressed without that uh, spasm of violence. And what she says is, um, as long as the spasm of violence is brief, right, it can have moderating and reformist effects because it serves to dramatize a grievance in a way that simply speaking at times won't. The point that she's making is that there are times when your grievances are palpable enough and direct enough that if you don't react violently, you can't react in a meaningful way to them in a way that will bring about reform. And so all she's saying is there are times when it's worth the risk to act violently in the name of reform. But what she then says very, you know, in, in the next sentence, she says, what this means is that violence pays, but it pays often indiscriminately, right? And the result is that violence can often get out of control and the reforms that are made are too much. For example, she says, Columbia went too far and it instituted instruction in Swahili and um, soul courses. And we can talk about, you know, her, her feelings about those. But the point is, she thinks that at times violence goes, leads people to react maybe too much. Um, but that doesn't mean the fact, doesn't change the fact that at times violence is useful and maybe even morally necessary. And that's her point. Um, and uh, while I think you're absolutely right that it's dangerous and it's a risk and it can lead to the introduction of the practice of violence into the whole body politic, as she says a couple sentences below where I've been reading, right? And that's the danger of it. Uh, and she says, in fact, the most probable change that violence is gonna bring about is not what you want, but she says, a more violent world. That's the more probable change. But that doesn't mean that there are instances where it's morally almost necessary to have an act of violence. That's that's her point. Um, you can disagree with it. There are, you know, there are certainly good reasons to disagree with it. But I, I, I do believe um, it's, it's, it's one that we need to take seriously. Uh, I agree with that, that what you just said. And it's obvious that that is true. Uh, and if you think of sort of a biological parallel, uh, somebody's heart stops and you inject them with some toxic material that gets them going again. The Problem is, if then you just keep putting in the toxic material, it kills them. So, I mean, I think Hannah Arendt's observation is correct. And of course, I was alive and lived through those days uh, on the West Coast, not the East Coast. Uh, and I saw the effects, uh, which I think were positive in some cases, uh, of exactly the kind of interventions of violence that you're talking about. Right. Thank you. Are there other so comments Roger, or questions? Yeah, Roger, Diane. Um, I'm just curious. And so we're talking about this in terms of um, this act of violence, and sometimes we react too much to it and just perpetuates more violence, right? And so one of the things I've been thinking about as you're talking is, I think of 9-11, right? So we, a terrorist attack were hit, and it fundamentally changed the world and how we all live, right? And some would argue that we've gone to some extremes um, in terms of our... Um, our um, individual rights have been compromised, et cetera. But I also, so that was one thought. And the other thought is how would Hannah Arendt think about this, this culture of terrorism, quote unquote, that we seem to live in 
and its relationship to violence and the way in which he frames this and has been talking about it. Well, okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question. I mean, and I, I, I always hazard to, uh, to put words in Hannah Arendt's mouth um, about contemporary issues. So with that um, aside, I'll try and answer it from my own reading of her work. Um, uh, there are times uh, in which violence is justified and pays. Um, uh, there's an ex interesting example Hannah Arendt talks about uh, near the end in the, in the epilogue of Eichmann in Jerusalem. Uh, she talks about two cases um, in which um, one is a Jew, Shalom Schwarzbad, and one is, a, is, a, is, a, is an Armenian, um, who take acts of revenge. In the case that I know better, the Shalom Schwarzbad case, uh, he goes, he's in Paris, he's a Ukrainian Jew, and he finds out that the uh, leader of the Ukrainian pogroms, uh, Ilan Petlora, is living in Paris. He stakes him out, waits outside a restaurant one day, says, Petlora comes out, and Shalom Shortsward says, are you Ivan Petlora? And he says, out of my way, you schwein. And he says, I, I'm here to revenge the Jews, and he shoots them six times. He drops his gun, he waits for the police to arrive, and says, I am Shalom Shortsward, I'm a Jew, and I have avenged the murderer. Um, and he's put on trial in Paris, and in 22 minutes, a Parisian jury uh, exonerates him, even though he admits that he killed uh, Shalom Schwarzbard. I mean, uh, Ilan Pelora. This is, you know, this is an act of terrorism of some sort, of revenge killing. And what Arendt says about it is very interesting. She says, an act like what Schwarzbard did can be in the service of justice, but only if he gives himself up and puts him on trial, self on trial, and takes and allows in a sense, a jury to decide whether what he did was just or not. He does an illegal act and brings it back into the law. So um, that's very much how I read, for example, the, the assassination of bin Laden. Um, it was an act that while it was illegal, uh, um, many people, I think I would imagine most people, thought it was just. I thought every, no, it's hard to imagine that bin Laden doesn't, doesn't deserve to be killed. Um, the, the only thing that was missing from an Arendtian perspective is that either the president or the SEALs should have put themselves on trial and allowed a jury to um, judge them. And in order to be a just act, or at least to be in the service of justice, uh, that was what was missing. And I've, I've written uh, an essay, a couple of essays on this case where I make that argument. Um, terrorism... Uh, you know, you know, is 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 different from revenge. Revenge is in the nature is in the name of justice. It makes a claim to do justice uh, beyond the law. Um, terrorism is 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 not making a claim to be just. It's making a claim. It's it's, it's attempting to um, uh, to to uh, publicize an injustice, uh, and it's saying that we're willing to. Publicize, do wrong, do an injustice to publicize an in, to publicize another injustice because it's the only option we have. Um, uh, morally, from from that point of view, um, it's hard to justify terrorism, uh, with the one exception of what Arendt I just read in my conversation with Gary that there are times when violence as a political act might be necessary in order to. Um, uh, uh, publicize a grievance or an injustice. But, uh, you know, one has to look at the case and look at the scenario and decide whether that was true or not. Um, you know, flying uh, two airplanes into the World Trade Centers and one into the Pentagon seems without doubt to be excessive um, uh, as an act of publicizing a grievance. Uh, and then there's the question of once you publicize the grievance, Right. So the Columbia students publicized their grievance in 1967. And what happened? The university responded quickly. Right. They saw the, in a sense, moral claim that the Columbia students were making. To use an example of recent history, 
the Islamic State or the Al Qaeda has publicized their grievance and the world has not jumped to their defense. I think that's the judgment that's been made. And at that point, not only are the means despicable, but the ends have failed to be persuasive to people. And uh, that shows uh, the injustice of, of that effort um, as, as judged in the public sphere. To continue to act violently as both Al Qaeda and, and ISIS have um, is, to, uh, is to simply perpetuate violence without making a claim to justice, I think, anymore. It becomes a political struggle and a violent and unjust one. Um, you know, that's, that's one attempt to, to answer your question. I'm sure some other might, people might have uh, other insights. I'm happy to hear some. Hi there. Hi there. Is someone else commenting? Oh. Yeah, hello. <laughs> oh, great. Um, hi. I, I wanted to say I found this uh, chapter interesting insofar as it provided a lot of different perspectives on the question of violence um, and a lot of different sort of ideas that feed into thinking about violence. First of all, the question of legitimacy was one of the major um, aspects, I think, that uh, Hannah Arendt was focusing on when talking about the academic sort of world and academics um, who create these sort of very um, thick uh, uh, sort of theoretical frameworks to which to justify and understand violence, which I think uh, is interesting to, to, to take into account when we are talking about um, violence itself. But then also uh, on the side of the left, from a concrete standpoint, she also um, talks about how the, you know, the leftists also try to justify uh, violence through uh, reference to Marx, who she critiques does not actually, in actuality, um, <clears throat> discuss violence as a means to an end. Um, um, right. Um, so I found that sort of her discussion of all of that interesting and how uh, through a reference to Marx, um, she talks about what, what is, uh, what, she, what she calls a creative destruction and how to, uh, she wants to understand basically how violence plays into this uh, relationship between Hegel and Marx and uh, um, how Marx turns Hegel upside down and uh, um, discusses, basically puts labor at the forefront anyway, uh, making the, the whole question a little bit more complex. But Basically, I would relate this notion of creative destruction then to the question of how technology also plays into violence, which we haven't really touched on, and maybe someone can explain. Um, in, in, you brought up ISIL uh, a moment ago, and uh, um, basically the question there would be is uh, that they're able to um, perpetuate a whole host of violence without necessarily having the, the uh, technological means um, to do so. What is the relationship between those? Um, and the third sort of curiosity that I have is that I've heard a lot of justifications about uh, uh, sort of these violent acts. Um, I wanted to understand what Arendt has to say about nonviolence because uh, um, I, I, I would I would uh, I would tend to think that she is arguing towards a sort of nonviolence. So I just uh, want to understand uh, what her stance might be on that uh, because I haven't read further. So um, thank you very much. A yeah. lot there. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Okay, um, there's a lot. Uh, I, I take it there's a question about Marx, a question about technology, and a question about nonviolence. Um, uh, you know, the question about Marx um, is 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 that she's she's being critical of Sartre primarily, uh, and and people in the the, the Sartrean tradition um, who are um, claiming to be both Marxists and uh, supporters of violence, um, and you know, she's simply uh, she simply she's she's saying on the one hand that this is somewhat disingenuous. Marx uh, was not someone um, who saw violence as the path towards change, um, which is not to say that he didn't think violence was important at some points. He did, but it was secondary. Um, uh, it wasn't violence that made change happen. It was um, at least in the middle to late Marx. Uh, a kind of um, historical necessity, uh, the, the, the unfolding of um, historical uh, social laws. And um, it's hard to be a Marxist and also uh, suggest that violence is going to change the direction of historical uh, necessary laws, because that's not what Marx said. And so, um, you know, one one point about this is simply uh, 
uh, a, a, you know, a discussion about Marx um, and, uh, um, you know, and a, and, a, and, a, and a critique of the somewhat incoherence of people like Sorel and, and, and Sartre uh, to the extent that they um, uh, embrace violence and Marxism. Um, the second point about technology is, is obviously an important point in, in the text. Uh, you know, her po it, it, it begins with this discussion that we live in a violent age and that Lenin thought that we would live in an age of war, revolution, and violence. And what Arendt is saying is that um, you can't understand violence without technology, without technical implementations. Uh, and then there's a couple points to be made. One is that, um, you know, we live at a time in which the technologies of violence are so extreme, are so deeply extreme that it could actually lead to the eradication of humanity. And at that point, um, the use of violence becomes uh, potentially genocidal, not only for individual races, but for the entire human race. And um, uh, she, she, she flirts with the idea uh, about whether war becomes an impossibility in in such a in such an environment, she says this much directly in the introduction to the book on revolution. Um, but here she's she simply raises the question: um, Is war something that will disappear? And she says, likely not, um, because in some ways we ha not because because we just haven't figured out another alternative to war as the final arbiter of um, international affairs. Uh, you can turn off your mics. It would be helpful if you're not speaking so we don't get that feedback. Um, and, then, um, and then there's this question of, okay, so if we're going to still have violence uh, and, and the impact of violence, um, what exactly does that mean? And uh, she draws uh, two conclusions to, from it. One is this, uh, this, this question that I find deeply uh, important in the essay uh, on page um, 108 in, this, in, this, in the uh, Crisis of the Republic volume, and in pages seven to eight, if you're using the other uh, edition, where she says that under these circumstances, namely the circumstances of technological violence, um, there are indeed few things that are more frightening than the steadily increasing prestige of scientifically minded brain trusters in the councils of government during the last decades. Um, the point here being that what these brain trusters and intellectuals uh, do is they calculate. They set up games where they think if we use violence here, we'll accomplish this there. And the hope is that we can control the means of violence. But as Gary and I were talking about earlier, that's almost impossible. And what they do is they create this thing where they say, well, 80% chance we use a bomb here, we'll win. But the 20% chance means something too. And um, she thinks that uh, this, this sort of intellectual brain truster, technocratic idea that we can somehow control and harness violence through pinpoint technologies of violence um, is one of the most dangerous uh, um, aspects of the modern society. Um, the final uh, point I want to make about technology, uh, it's one that I I'm, I'm, I'm find incredibly perceptive on her part, is a little bit later on page 112 in the Crisis of the Republic edition around footnote 12, where she says, um, that uh, as long as uh, as long as the violent leaders, the government, the rulers, uh, the tyrants or the democratic rulers um, have to use soldiers and bureaucrats and people to implement their violence, um, violence can never be total. Uh, it has to be. Uh, there's always going to have to be some persuasion of some group of the population um, in order to execute the violent orders. And, you know, an example of this, of course, is when the, you know, the, the soldiers in, in the Arab Spring refused to uh, clear the square or the soldiers in China in Tiananmen Square refused to shoot the, the protester in the white shirt. These are, these are examples that mean something to us. Violence is not total. 
But she says the one thing that could change that is the rise of robot soldiers. If we develop robot police forces and robot soldiers, then you reach a point eventually uh, at which um, it is possible to create a completely violent order, one that doesn't depend on um, persuasion and consent of at least some part of the population. And that is, I think, for our time, uh, a, a deeply present danger and one that Arendt was already thinking about in 1969 when she wrote this. Um, the, last, the last point actually I want to make is, and it goes to something you just said, is that uh, in an age of technological um, violence, um, the idea that a powerful country can impose its will on other countries is increasingly uh, wrong. Um, technology offers cheap ways of doing incredible damage to poor and powerless people. So if you're uh, a terrorist group of a couple of thousand people, but you acquire chemical weapons or nuclear weapons, uh, you can do enormous amounts of damage. And so one of the uh, points that she makes in this and other essays is that the rise of technology makes the claim of um, great power uh, almost laughable because even a great power can be brought to its knees by uh, a smaller power. Uh, and that's what you see in, you know, that's what happened to us in Vietnam uh, in, to a certain extent. Um, and it's very hard to win a war, as we've seen in Afghanistan and Iraq, even if you have massive uh, uh, excesses in, in violent capacity against a technologically savvy uh, opponent. Um, the third thing you mentioned is nonviolence. Uh, and the answer, you know, again, I, 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 an answer to that is that um, nonviolence is a kind of action. Um, as can be violence, as I said before in my discussion with, with Gary. And Arendt is not a proponent either of nonviolence or of violence. Um, she thinks that um, we need to look at both as how they're being used in their particular situation. Um, she's, you know, she, she certainly was deeply impressed by the um, nonviolent civil rights movement and spoke glowingly about it at many times. Um, she was also impressed by the some of the violence of the students during the student movements where they rioted and took over buildings. She sometimes was upset about those, but time she was impressed by it. So I don't think she's a, it's not like she's only in favor of violence or nonviolence. She sees how both can be used and they both have to be used correctly for her. I know that's a long answer, but there are three long questions, so I'm trying to do my best. Anyone else? I know there was someone else trying to ask a question mm -hmm. earlier. Good morning. Morning, Rosanil. Um, I am glad you brought out about the um, the students again because I was reading. I I think it was on page 19 that she states that when the African American communities, the students had support from their communities. They even, in Aaron's eyes, their claims weren't so um, fair. They had uh, a bigger impact uh, in the establishment, in the university establishment, and uh, they can reach uh, change. And uh, in this um, this paragraph, brought me the idea that right now. I think worldwide, we we have uh, the words are very unpopular, even though uh, it's a need in several places right now, and there is justification to uh, to war to defeat uh, terrorism and other situations. Uh, there is there is 
there is not um, popular, they are unpopular. And I think the the last war who was popular was the World War II. So in this context, when technology, technology uh, can annihilate the human race, and that leads to um, unpopularity of war, how can how can we um, defeat these uh, menaces? And how can we, as political scientists uh, and humanists, um, gain gain moral support to to violence when it's needed, and also in a context when the the political establishment says mostly in Western countries that studying humanities is a waste of money and time. Um, so there's a lot in, in that question as well. And, um, uh, you know, you started with the students and you ended up with war today. Um, you know, why are wars continued to be fought? Um, I think there's a couple of different reasons. One is interests and uh, a second is um, uh, PR. <laughs> Uh, public relations, um, and Arendt writes a lot about this. And, you know, it relates to her discussion of the student movement. So maybe I'll start there and then move from that to war. I mean, this this, this discussion about the student protesters that you brought up, um, again, on page 120 to 121 in Crisis of the Republic, around footnote 30, uh, 29 and 30, if you're in the other edition and you can find it that way, um, is to say that there was a fundamental difference between the um, the black protest movement uh, and the white protest movement um, in the 60s, uh, and a couple of differences. One was um, that the black protest movement largely was driven by interests, um, namely that they had been unjustly discriminated against uh, and didn't have the necessary um, uh, funds or uh, or or credentials uh, to 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 get into the university, and they um, uh, sought to remedy that injustice. Um, what she says about that is, generally, their claims were considered uh, quite popular, at least by members of their community who weren't students, and as a result, they were often. Um, taken seriously, and they were often uh, acknowledged. Um, on the contrary, uh, many in the white student movement, um, uh, for her, while they were motivated by very admirable moral reasons, um, they never got over uh, the fact that even though they were acting morally, and thus in their minds selflessly, um, the workers and the not, and the people not in the universities never supported them, um, and never uh, and never um, really got behind them. And she says a couple of things about this. One is that these students and leftists uh, were, on a, were 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 suffering from a nostalgia, thinking that um, they represented the Marxist left when they didn't. Um, uh, but two, uh, which is that they they weren't actually um fighting for interests they were fighting for an idea now um in the end what rn thinks is that they didn't understand the idea they were fighting for um they they said they were fighting for um uh the social question poverty racial justice um what 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 things that uh, were, were important, but we're not going to provide, uh, help the working class uh, uh, in any way. They were very much uh, cultural issues. Um, what RN thinks that they should have said they were fighting for, and what they really um, most were fighting for, although they often didn't know it, um, was uh, participatory democracy and uh, 
a, a vision of democracy that is active and fun and engaged uh, rather than passive and um, simply uh, letting the, the, the people, the elites run the country. Um, and it's this lack of understanding of the um, intellectual uh, grounds for their revolution, for their apparent revolution, that RN um, repeatedly uh, takes them to task for. Um, how does that relate to the war question? Uh, well, I think that there's different kinds of war. There's wars of interest. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, you said the last popular war was World War II. Uh, I, I'm not sure how true that is. Um, there certainly have been, I mean, around the world, popular wars since then. The most popular wars are wars of defense. When somebody attacks you and, and you defend yourself, um, uh, these are considered to be the highest interest uh, because you have to survive. Um, but there are there are popular wars. Uh, I mean, interestingly enough, we live at a time in which governments around the world are deeply unpopular. But who's the most popular um, secular uh, leader in the world today? Vladimir Putin with a popularity rating of 86% in Russia. Um, and he's not exactly been a peacemaker. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know if, if it's wars that are popular or unpopular. The question is why you go to the war. Um, you know, do you go to war to foreign interest or do you go to war, you know, for some public relations grounds? I mean, what Arendt is arguing around this period, around the Vietnam War, is that the reason we went to war in Vietnam kept changing. They kept saying it was for this, it was for that, it was for this. And she says, in the end, if you read the Pentagon Papers and you really look at it, we didn't go to war for any tangible interest. We went into war to uphold the image of ourselves as a superpower who would um, go to war to protect the West. And she says that's a kind of public relations war where you're trying to protect an image. And she says that's and, and, and that's what she gets really upset about in many ways, because A, um, that's not a real interest. And B, uh, it's not something you can argue against because every time that, you know, the interest you, you give for the war is shown to be wrong, you change your ground. And, um, and, it's, and it allows you to convince yourself at all times that it's justified to go to war without actually taking into account a real, a real consideration of the pros and cons, the interests involved in the war. Um, and so uh, I think that's an important uh, this distinction between violence in the name of interest versus violence in the name of some sort of a um, unthought moral cause uh, is for her um, an important distinction. If you're interested more in that question, if you have the Crisis of the Republic edition, this 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 book that it's the one place that on violence is published, her essay on um, Lying in politics is where she really uh, explores this question of interest versus public relations in war quite in depth and uh, is worth reading. We could even, if you'd like, read that next uh, if this is an issue that people are interested in. Probably have time for one or two more questions or comments. This is just Gary. I want to make it the comment, the comment that that was a very helpful thing you just said. I really appreciated that. That's, and I had never read that before. That's great. What, Gary, you want to say a little more? What did you think was particularly well, helpful for you? Well, uh, I mean, essentially you're making it easier to understand the fine points of Aaron's argument, so it's not just a black and white kind of thing. Uh, the idea that sometimes our wars are essentially a public relations ploy to say we're important or that we're going to be able to do things, uh, which I admit, I mean, I've read all these things before. I've just had never gotten that. Uh, that really does help in that if you're gonna justify violence, what 
is the interest, the actual tangible thing that is going to be accomplished through the war, whether it's defense or uh, some offensive action that is going to accomplish a benefit to somebody, if there isn't that kind of an actual tangible benefit, then obviously the violence starts having no justification at all. And yet maybe there are some justifications. And this, this goes back to your and my conversation earlier in the discussion that maybe violence can be justified, but you've got to look at what is it actually doing in terms of interest as opposed to uh, a quote unquote public relations approach. And I had just never had that you know, had that kind of framework before. I think it's very helpful to me, at least. That's it's a good point. And, you know, go go, oh, go ahead. Someone from one from two hundred one wants to talk, so I'll let yeah. that in. Yeah. Who's two hundred one? Yeah. Um, my name's uh, hi hi there. Um, my name's Sarah Wellington. Um, this is my first time um, in this group. Is, Welcome, can Sarah. Hear me or, um, yeah, so I just wanted to make a, uh, a couple comments about what, we, what was being talked about earlier um, concerning extrajudicial assassination. Um, so I, you know, my understanding is that um, extrajudicial assassination under international law is illegal under any circumstance, whether or not um, a moral justification could be mustered. Um, so, so I guess my point is the, that I'm surprised to hear a discussion of the assassinate extrajudicial killing of Osama bin Laden as um, in the same sentence as, as a, a, an idea that it would be somehow justified. And that in the our, you know the reading that we had that we're discussing today, um, that maybe violence can be justified, but we don't really know always know the outcome. Um, and I I would argue that we very much do know the outcome. Um, maybe not precisely with precision, but we very much do know the outcome of a, a government like the United States conducting extrajudicial assassinations of um, leaders such as Osama bin Laden, um, no matter, you know, no matter what he may be um, guilty of crime, uh, the crimes he may be guilty yep. of. So right. we do okay. know so, that Sarah, that kind of violence would result in um, extreme, uh, extreme rise in revenge, right? So, so I'll just finish quickly um, your example, Roger, about um, the assassination in was it in was it in Germany the um, in France in France right and the assassination in France and he was acquitted there was a trial he was acquitted he was justified in that assassination um, but I do think we very much do know that in the long run any type of violence of this nature of extrajudicial assassinations will result in a rise in revenge in another group of people, such as we're seeing right now with the government of Israel upon the Palestinian people and the collective punishment that's being carried out in the names of crimes committed, um, you know, upon, in the, you know, upon the Jewish people. So I think it's very clear, we, in fact, do know the result um, of, of most violence. And I'll make one other quick point that um, where is it ever mentioned? Does she ever mention that um, the majority of this violence that we're all discussing is actually predominantly carried out by men? Um, I, I don't really see that um, talked about a lot, and that that was my question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Sarah, and welcome. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the group. Um, uh, the first point you make. Um, is that the assassination of Osama bin Laden uh, was a violation of international law, which I should at least point out is inc is not clear. Um, Michael Walzer, for example, uh, one of the leading uh, writers on international law, um, certainly argues that in wartime assassination of generals is is legal. Um, the the question is is this is he a combatant or is he a civilian? Is he engaged in combat or not? 
Um, and in, 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 the, in, in law, you know, that would be a, a meaningful question. Um, so if you were actually were bringing an international law case, so after it happened, there was a big debate in international law circles about whether this was um, legal in international law. The, 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 it turned for many people on the fact that of whether how you understood where Osama bin Laden was. He was in a civilian neighborhood in Pakistan. Um, the question is, in the modern battlefield, is that part of a being on a battlefield or not? And 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 these were these were the kind of questions that international lawyers debated. Um, regardless of how one comes down on that, my argument was um, even assuming it's an extra legal act, uh, which I'm willing to uh, at least assume, uh, it could be justified, but only if right the president or the people who actually did it um, put themselves on trial and uh, and 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 allowed um, a jury of some sort uh, to either acquit them or not and take that risk. And so my argument uh, based on the Arendt case of Shalom Schwarzbard and others that she talks about is that there are times when extra legal actions can be made into the service of justice, but they require a risk namely the risk that if they're not seen to be just, um, they will be seen as unjust and will be punished. And so, you know, what I argued, and I know this is politically impractical, and, and so maybe, you know, it's, you can say it's, a, it's sort of a silly argument, but I was saying is what if Obama had gone before Congress and said, I did this, it may be a violation of U.S. law, if not international law, um, but I think it was justified and vote on it and taken the consequences of their vote, that to me would have brought the act back into uh, the realm of justice. Whereas the refusal to do that left it hanging in some sort of kind of no man's land. Um, the question of whether revenge always leads to more revenge and violence always leads to more violence is one I'm very interested in. I, I was, I've written many articles on revenge, um, which anyone who wants can find. Um, uh, and one of the interesting things about revenge is that this idea that an eye, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, uh, will lead the, leave the world blind and toothless, um, is not always true. There are acts of revenge that do lead to more revenge and more violence. But there are acts of revenge that are seen as just and can stop the violence, right? And um, they're rare, uh, that I admit, but I don't think they're, um, they don't exist. And uh, the Shalom Schwarzbart case was one example of that. It didn't lead to more violence. The point is that when, when, when an act of revenge is seen as just, it changes the narrative, and this is what Gary and I were talking about the very first question of this of this session, which is there are times when an act of violence in done quickly and with justice and then opens itself up for critique and evaluation can actually stop the process, can, can say, look, this shows that what was going on, the pogroms in Ukraine, what Osama bin Laden was doing was wrong, and the fact that we acted in this risky way and people have said you were right to do so, in a sense, remakes the consensus and says it is wrong to be doing what these people were doing. And even though what you did was illegal, it worked and it's right and we stopped the process. Now, does that always work? No. And you brought up the, the, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I mean, here's a situation in which clearly – um, both sides think they are acting for justice. Uh, the world is, I think, divided, I think is the only fair way to say it. Um, and uh, instead of pulling back from violence and saying, in this case, violence is not leading to anything except more violence, that's not what's happening. And I don't want to get into a who's at fault in, in this situation, but it's clearly uh, not worked in that situation. And I think that's the majority of situations. Um, 
As for the, the gender aspect of this, uh, um, I have to admit, I, I haven't thought enough about it in this particular case. One of the, I mean, I, I, since I've done a lot of work on revenge and I've also done some work on gender and revenge, I can simply say one thing, which is that in um, historical societies or, or traditional societies, um, it is traditionally the women's role to call for vengeance, not the man's role. Um, and there are different reasons given for this in the literature. Um, but the fact that that's the case is not debatable. So it's, it's the woman's role um, to sort of demand of men that they take out the revenge, but that they're often the arbiters of, of, of the need for revenge, um, which may or may not complicate what you were saying. I haven't thought enough about your particular question uh, to say that I just throw that out there. Um, we're at 12 o'clock. Uh, can I, I wanna just ask one question before I say goodbye. Um, was the video that we sent out helpful and about what you're looking for? Should it be shorter about that? Um, is this a good new format? I'd love some comments if people don't mind. If you have to go, I understand and I thank you and we'll see you next month. Uh, and I hope you keep enjoying reading Arendt. But if you would like to stay for two, one or two minutes and give me your input on the new format and the video, uh, I'd love to hear it. Uh, this is Gary. Uh, I liked the new format quite a bit, Roger. I felt there was more exchange in this particular uh, part of the uh, process. And then your video was very much what you had been doing in the earlier iteration, compressed, but you gave the overview uh, with what is terrific scholarship uh, and knowledge of Arendt wide uh, as well as narrow. And so I thought it was better. I, I really appreciated the new format. Are there any dissenting, dissenting views on that? I mean, does anyone not like the new format or have problems or suggestions for the videos? Can you hear me, Roger? Yes. Oh, this is Jack Hershaw. Hi, Jack. I, I'm sorry for the go, but, uh, because I'm on a phone. I, I wanted to say that I very much like my new approach. Uh, the, um, I, I, I think that the presentation in the video presentation itself could have uh, it was it, it came a little late and I, and and it, it, it for me it was not uh, there was a um, I, 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 the presentations that you made in the previous conversations were lengthier and therefore clearer and I was hoping something like that in the video but the video nevertheless was a, I agree with Gary a very good step forward in terms of advancing the total conversation. I, so, I wanted to add that I, I missed the early part of the, uh, today's meeting, for, I don't want to go into why, but I, I had a question which I'd like for you to, to think about and maybe bring up at the next meeting, which has to do with um, the, the point of view of the student protesters that um, uh, Hannah Arendt was speaking of, so I was writing about, uh, at a moment when they were seriously discussing violence, right? Um, uh, some of them actually broke off into organizations dedicated to violence, um, but they used it as their background, as you said, Sorel and Fanon. And so my question has to do with what, it's not clear to me where Hannah Arendt is on the question of the psychological need to resist with violence under certain circumstances. That is, uh, I, I, I'm not talking about the soul cleansing stuff, but the idea that there are certain circumstances when violence is not only called for for justice, but is necessary in, to for the perpetrators to actually come alive. I know she says that isn't really the case, there is no coming alive like that in Marx, but there is in Fanon, and I don't think that she actually responds clearly to that. So I'm wondering if there's other references that you can find and so on. Uh, and I'll shut up now. Um, human, um, uh, uh, 
in 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 sort of uh, action and thinking in 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 Marx we become human through labor, and for in Aristotle we become human through action or politics. And Arendt is clearly on the on the uh, Aristotelian end of that. So while she will sometimes justify violence for justice, she doesn't think violence makes us human. Um, that doesn't mean she thinks violence is inhuman, um, but that's not how she thinks we get to human. I just want to say, I, with Jack, in, in response to the video question, um, it did come late. This was our first time doing it. We had some hiccups. I apologize. We're going to try and make it earlier and better. Um, but I did want to ask the question that Jack raised. I mean, I was hoping to keep it to 10 minutes. Um, we went longer. Uh, Jack says he wants it even longer. Is this, was it too long? I mean, I can make it longer. It's easy to make it longer. The hard part is making it shorter and still giving you enough. Does anyone else want to talk about the length? Uh, this is Kim Hogg. Hi, Kim. And uh, I, I certainly would uh, appreciate it to be longer um, because I really enjoyed your discussion. So longer, I think, is great. Okay. I mean, you know, that's easy for me. I just, I'm trying to be uh cognizant of the fact that many of you are busy people and don't want to sit and watch you know we try and do this one hour a month and i didn't know you'd want to do another half hour um longer i can do <laughs> it's easy it's easy for me to go longer uh uh and maybe we'll try and do uh i'll try longer next time and if people like it we'll continue anyone object thank you i appreciate the feedback because we actually thought you guys would all say it was too long so uh, actually, it isn't necessarily uh, you shouldn't aim at length. But, <laughs> uh, but, but in this particular instance, I personally felt that there was more more substance could have been added that would have made the this conversation richer. That's the way that was what I felt, and uh, because because you do have a way, um, uh, and that's one of the reasons that. In previous iterations, you actually dominated the conversation because you had so much to offer relative to the rest of us. So, um, so I think that I, 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 I want more of that. But if we you can do it more succinctly and still get this, that would be great. I will try. And uh, you're still welcome to continue the conversation on our Google uh, Hangout uh, chat which uh, Hannah and Center virtual reading group on Google Hangouts or Google communities, or I, I have a hard time with the technology as well. But um, if you can find it, uh, I will try and uh, respond to further questions. Thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt.